conducted throughout the evening on LBC. But in this hour, I, I want to speak to you about something that I have been ruminating on for the past 24 hours because I was listening to my colleague Sheila Fogarty's show yesterday and there was a caller that stopped me in my tracks. You can actually listen to it over on LBC's Twitter. They've clipped it up. But this caller said that the Tories stood for Britain and Labour stood for minorities. And there was just so much to unpick in that statement. And immediately I thought to myself, well, why are the interests and concerns of these non-specified minorities seen as being at odds with the majority of the population? And also, how is the party responsible for austerity, a Brexit campaign which tore the country apart and one of the worst responses to COVID in the world in any way for Britain? But that was a kind of secondary consideration. It was really this idea of, of minorities versus the rest of us that just fascinates me and terrifies me in equal measure. And I don't want to suggest that this particular caller is alone in believing this. In fact, he went on to argue that it wasn't his personal opinion, just a reflection of what the electorate believe. But as soon as I heard that conversation with Sheila, I started to see exactly what he meant. And it just so happened that after I had listened to that clip, I saw a tweet by Musa Okwango, an author whose book, One of Them, I'm massively enjoying at the moment, really recommend it. It's about his experience of going to Eton and what that does for your ego and psyche. And what he tweeted was so revealing to see people saying that progressive parties don't care about ordinary people, only about woke causes. It's so interesting who gets to be ordinary and why basic human rights are seen as luxuries. I guess Windrush and Grenfell didn't happen to ordinary people. And it's obvious what he's driving at there, isn't it? And of, and of course, there is unarguably a, a racial element to all of this. But before I get onto that, I want to tell you what I think is going on here. So the tabloids are awash with this talk of wokeness, which is suggested, usually without evidence, to have originated in the Labour Party. And I had a brilliant example of this on Twitter during the last hour. I had some bloke on Twitter tweet me to say that I was responsible for the Labour Party being unelectable. I have no ties to the Labour Party whatsoever, other than being friendly with a couple of people in it, as all the presenters here get to be friends with politicians and public figures. I am not part of the Labour Party. I have no hand in the Labour Party's decision making. I'm not an activist for the Labour Party. In fact, the only party that I have worked with as an activist on mental health issues are the Conservatives. It didn't end well and it will come as no surprise to anyone listening that my politics fall to left of centre. But I have nothing whatsoever to do with the Labour Party. So why you have taken my perceived wokeness as evidence of the character of the Labour Party, Twitter bloke, I will never know. But that's how it happened. These people claim that these activists want to tear down every statue, make all toys gender neutral, and that this is what the so-called left stand for. And here's what they're missing. This is what they don't understand. It's that it's the tabloids who've chosen and are leading that agenda. What happens is they see some throwaway remark made during a speech or a sentence in an academic paper somewhere that would suggest, let's say, for example, that children would be happier if they played with gender neutral toys. And then they pick up the phone and they phone around and they find someone who will argue this. They'll set them up against their self-appointed voice of reason who claims it's all PC gone mad and our way of life is under threat. And then they splash it across the front page. So that's the conversation we're having. But it's in no way of reflection of what's happening in West Minster, it's nothing more than a diversionary tactic. And it's used to enrage the population, keep them distracted, while the real politics and policies are happening behind closed doors. And it works. People are falling for it. And in doing so, they have somehow managed to persuade working class white people that they have more in common with Boris Johnson an old Etonian born into an enormous amount of wealth and privilege, which he inherited, than they do with quote-unquote minorities. And you might remember a few weeks ago, we had an author and academic called Emma Dibiri on the show who explained 
how the concept of race as we know it today was invented in colonial Barbados in the 17th century. And to paraphrase what she said, and this will definitely be less articulate than Emma, but bear with me. She said wealthy English landowners used the concept of a shared white identity to persuade poor Irish people they had more in common with them than enslaved Africans because they were terrified of all oppressed people of whatever colour teaming up and overthrowing their oppressors. And don't you think the exact same thing is happening now? And that they're using this this ridiculous word woke, which I've claimed now. I am woke, but only because I've been told so often that I'm woke. I'm trying to reclaim it and use it positively. But that's how they're doing it. So if you see anything in my analysis that you recognize i'd be really interested in your take on how this has happened how has boris johnson managed to present himself as a man of the people more aligned with the common man than the victims of the windrush scandal or the grenfell tower disaster and if i can see that's nonsense why can't other people